for coming. I'd like to say a few introduct in, uh, like a few words to introduce you to the event, and then I give the word to Ramon. Ramon, thanks for coming and welcome, welcome here from our part. And what I'd like to say is that this lecture is um, a collaboration organized by the Decolonial Group and the Laboratory Critical Europeanization Research, which is kind of a premiere. And, um, well, the Decolonial Group, I even made some notes today because I thought I'm going to forget everything. If not. The Decolonial Group um, is a group of people like from very diverse backgrounds that shares uh, the interest on decolonial theory and on decolonial methodology. And um, we meet quite regularly to organize different things. And I just wanted to announce that to also let you know that you're welcome to join us if you want to. And I'm going to pass a paper later on where you can put down your email address and uh, get in touch with us. And um, the other thing I mentioned, the laboratory critical uh, Europeanization Research is something that is it like a context that is um, uh, here at the Institute for European Ethnology. Um, and the research groups there are organized in laboratories. And uh, the idea is that people who share uh, like topics, for example, city, migration, gender, Europeanization, work together from their different perspectives. and. Uh, the laboratory Europeanization is led by Professor Regina Rundhild, who I'd like to welcome also, and who maybe wants to say a few words on oh, that. Oh, you're, you're putting it really nicely all together. So <laughs> everything that's left for me to say is to welcome Ramon once more here. Thank we're you. We're very happy to collaborate on that event. Thank you. And we're very interested in the subject you're going to talk about today. Okay. And it was actually our wish also at the laboratory that we learn something more about the decolonial concept of alterity okay. uh, versus in, in, in opposition probably to that concept of difference with which we as anthropologists have a long tradition, problematic tradition, which we reflect Critically, and this is one of the tasks that we debate in in that laboratory, critical mm -hmm. Europeanization research, and we will continue that debate ah, yes, on Friday. Friday. You should say that. Probably. Yes, and that's also welcome <coughs> that event too. So. Exactly, you're all welcome to join us on Friday at ten, where we want to discuss your presentation and also. Uh, like in in connection with what we did before and before just to like get you on board um, before we discuss or we try to think about the role of modernity um, when you think about Europe and how Europe became what it is now and we read concepts like uh, the transmodernity one by Dussel and we discussed alterity and that's why we came up with the crossroads of the decolonial group and uh, the research laboratory and uh, we try to kind of cooperate on this and to learn from other perspectives. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah, that's why I would like to welcome, as I said before, Ramon. And I also want to say a few words about Ramon. Uh, for that, I downloaded a CV before to like <laughs> see what you're doing a bit because, and I didn't know how many things you're doing. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, um, he's. Associate Professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and also Senior Researcher in Paris at the Maison de Lyon. Um, and then I wanted to say a few, like, for example, give you an idea about a few visits and fellowships he did, but then there were so many pages that I decided not to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then, that, that's better, yeah. Well, um, and the same with the publication list. So I just want to mention that his research interests, as far as I could um, see there, are, as we all know, like, when I, I got, yeah, ethnic and race studies, um, decolonial theory, world system theory, mm -hmm. and um, that's why we're very happy to have you here and to have an expert about the topic that we wanted to discuss today. And, um, yeah, finally, I would like to thank a few people. First of all, I would like to thank the people from the Decolonial Group who contrib contributed today, because it was really like it's the first time that we also, for example, uh, had someone writing applications to get funding for the filming and those things. 
So thanks for that. Thanks to the Refrat for supporting us. Thanks for the room to the Georg Simmel Centrum. They collaborate regularly with us, and it's very good to have an institution here that supports us in many ways. Um, to Regina, as I said before, and to Ramon. And now I also would like to give you the word, and I'm curious to hear what you're gonna say about the difference versus alterity, alterity question in decolonial methods, epistemologies of the South, philosophy of liberation, and Fanonian philosophy. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, really, I, I am always uh, happy to be here sharing with all of you. And we have been now over a few years sharing many spaces here in Berlin. I'm very happy always to come here and uh, see very friendly faces in the room. So um, thank you uh, to the laboratory, Regina. Uh, thank you to the decolonial group. Uh, thank you, uh, Mikael, that's que, because uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's really always a, a pleasure for me to be here with, with all of you. Um, <clears throat> what, what I would like to, to do, I'm going to first do a little very sketchy and very, uh, how can I say, simplistic uh, history. Although, if you want to know more details about that history, you could go to the Facebook page of the Islamic Human Rights Commission. I gave a talk there uh, two days ago where I went in detail about the history of the things I'm going to say here very simplistically, just to put a, a context of the things I'm going to be saying. Uh, is the Human Rights, uh, the Islamic Human Rights Commission in London, and they recorded the audio and they put it in their, in their, in their page in Facebook. And last night they did also a video, and I, it's going to be there in, in the next few days. Uh, I go in detail about the history, all of that, in case you want to pursue a little more of the things I'm going to say now in a very sketchy and simplistic way now, uh, because I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, <clears throat> but it's necessary to say it. Uh, how did we get to the point where basically in the westernized university uh, the canon of thought is grounded fundamentally on the thinking of males of five countries? How did we get there? That is Italy, France, Germany, UK, and USA. How did we get to this point? The world is huge. It's very diverse. There's not just men in the room, okay? How can we get to this point where we have Western males of only five countries of Europe, not even other parts of Europe, they're even excluded from the conversation, you see? And how did this happen? Okay, this is what I'm trying to say in a very sketchy way, although I develop more of this in these other talks. Uh, uh, and I, I want to begin there because I'm going to be calling the foundational structure of the westernized university, epistemically the foundation is racist slash sexist. Okay? That's the term I'm going to be using. Uh, I, I use the term westernized university to talk about a global structure of power. I'm not saying the western university. I'm saying the westernized university because the westernized university is a global structure of power. It's not just, it's not a European problem. It's a world problem today because the westernized university with this canon of thought is everywhere. You could be in Berlin, Paris, New York, San Francisco, or you could be in New Delhi, Dakar, Rio de Janeiro, wherever, you know, this is, this, you open the door in a sociology department, enter the room, and you're reading the same guys. Even if you are far away in the world, the Western University carries this epistemology everywhere. And you, you read the same guys of these five countries. Of course, there are exceptions, 
in that structure. I'm not saying, I'm not talking absolutist ways, please. There are, you know, uh, professors like Regina and other professors that are exceptions to the rule and, and are there, you know, and sitting in the room, you know, so these things are there. I'm not saying in an absolutist sense, but what is it that is the trend or the hegemonic or the dominant structure of this type of university? Well, you're supposed to read or master the theories of males of these five countries. Now, these five countries are what? 12% of the population of the world? In terms of population, you add the, the numbers, they're only 12%. 12%. And if they're only males, it's 6 or 5%, I don't know. I mean, it's really lower than that. So the social historical experience that have produced what we call social theory, critical theory, a philosophy, social scientific theory, etc., is a, a basically founded a, on the basis of these a, exclusions, okay, of women, be that Western women or non-Western women, they're out, a, and a women or men from non-Western locations, okay? And uh, and so this structure, uh, you cannot have it more pro provincial than that, you know, because it's 6% of the social historical experience of the population of the world. And you're supposed to learn them and apply them elsewhere. Okay? You're supposed to learn them and apply. Look at this word, apply. Okay? And so it doesn't matter if the social historical experience of the places you are studying or researching are completely different, you see? It doesn't matter if in those places people have produced theories according to the, those social historical experience. It doesn't matter. You're, not, you're supposed to learn the epistemology, the, the theories of these guys, of these five countries, and apply them everywhere. And so uh, I, this is provincialism at its worst. Be but disguised as universalism, you see? Because then what the way is represented is as if there are some people that are universal beings and other people are not capable of being universal beings, no? People who are, uh, people who are particularistic, okay? That are not able to produce universal theory, right? This is more or less the structure. Now, how did we get there? This is what I'm going to say now in a sketchy way, because I don't want to spend too much time there. But we, if we want to know how we got there, I think we have to start uh, from several locations. Okay, The first one is late 15th century Andalusia, okay? in the south what is today called the south of Spain, where you have the conquest by the Spanish monarchy, Catholic monarchy, of uh, the territory called Andalusia that was an Islamic uh, political power, okay? And the Islamic political power, they had at the time, uh, for example, just the Library of Cordoba had more than half a million books. The largest library in what we call Europe today didn't have even a thousand books at the time. Cordoba Library have more than half a million books. Okay? The Granada Library okay, have over 250,000 books. I mean, I'm talking about books from all over the world because the Islamic civilization went from the Atlantic all the way, you know, North Africa, Middle East, South Asia, East China, Indonesia, Mindanao. That was, that was cover a whole world. So you have books from all over the world. Well, not just w books from Arabic or Islam. Or they, you have all these different sciences, you know, producing other places, being uh, accessible there and... Uh, at the time, 
right to divorce to women. I mean, there's things we forget, given a lot of the Islamophobia going on in Europe today and in a lot of the narrative. There was right, a lot of Christian women to divorce, they have to go to Andalusia to get a divorce because in, in, in the Christian world, there was not a right to divorce until very recent, okay? In, in the Muslim world, it was already written like the right to divorce, all this stuff. But anyway, this is a, a, a long history. So what happened is that the, 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 the political power of, with all the critique we can do, and you know, we don't have time to go into all of that, uh, but the political, Islamic political power in Andalusia had the, the notion of one state with multiple identities and mul multiple spiritualities coexisting, okay? And the rights of people with different spiritualities. Uh, that was going on in Andalusia. That's why there are many people today looking at, at Andalusia and saying and talking about the paradigm of Andalusia or the paradigm of Cordoba. There are many people looking at this because it provides a model of coexistence of difference and things like this. And what happened with the Spanish monarchy was that it imposed a different rule. It imposed one state, one identity, one religion. Okay? And anybody who didn't fit into this identity and this religion, in this case Christianity, they were either expelled from the place or killed. Okay? You have to be you have to, you want to live there, you have to convert. And the conversion was done mostly by force, okay? So you have there a ethnic cleansing of these territories, okay, in what we call today settler colonialism, because they wipe out people out, you see, and occupy the land with Christian coming from the north, okay? A leader of what we see in any settled colonialist society later on, but you could see that happening in Andalusia in the late 15th century. Now, the imposition of one state, one identity, one religion immediately, you know, put a situation in which Jews have to escape the place. Muslims have to escape the place. You want to continue being Jew or Muslim, you have to leave the place, otherwise they will kill you. You see, if you, if, oh, the other alternative is just to convert, even if by force, or even you want a fake conversion, that's the only way you could stay. If not, you were either killed or expelled from the place. So many, we forget that many Jews were escaping Christian Europe over centuries and going to Islamic territories because that was where they had the rights recognized. Okay, it is something we have forgotten over centuries and now with some of the lati latest narrative that we hear of orientalists today and some Zionist orientalists etc., as if the conflict for example in the Middle East is a, is a millenarian conflict between uh, Jews and Muslims that go back thousands of years this is not true this is a recent conflict and it's a colonial conflict and it's, it's have nothing to do with religion even though there are people expressing the conflict this way but in fact it's a colonial conflict it's Central colonialism uh, ha happening no, in our eyes. But this was happening in the late 15th century. So uh, why I'm saying this? Because then you have here a, a ethnic cleansing and genocidal policies put in place against Muslim and, and Jews. Uh, the idea was purity of blood. They used the term purity of blood because purity of blood meant something different than what than the meaning it acquired later. It was a proto-racist notion, but it's not fully racist. We cannot say it's a fully racist notion because it was more about, okay, we Spanish monarchy, Catholic monarchy, we conquered the territory, and now we have all these people saying they converted. So I wanna make sure that they are really converted. So forget the idea of Foucault that biopolitics began in the 19th century. Biopolitics began there in the 15th century. And they were surveilling the population under the notion of purity of blood, which meant the following. I want to know if your grandparents or your parents are, uh, belong, you know, what, what is the ancestry? You are Muslim, you are Jew, or what? Okay? If you are, have purity of blood, you were Christian all along, it's fine. We don't look at you. But if you happen to have a Jewish parent or grandmother or whatever, or Muslim, then we need to surveil you to make sure you're not faking conversion, okay? 
so they will survey you. Now, uh, this notion, uh, when in 14, the, the whole expa colonial expansion between Al Andalus and the Americas are part of a single process, despite the fact that we usually look at this as separate processes, okay? Because in the negotiation between Columbus and uh, 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 when he went to meet the king and the queen of Spain, he came with the Indian enterprise, and in the first meeting, he said to the king, here is the Indian enterprise, and the queen said, this is great, but there, we need to do this by step. First step is destroy Al-Andalus, and the last remaining power structure is Granada, until we unify the, the, the territory under one single state, the monarchy, with one identity and one religion, we are not ready to go abroad. We first have to destroy this, and then we can unify, we're united, and go abroad. And so you have to wait until the fall of Granada. And Colombo said, okay, you know, I'll wait. And so he went to Santa Fe, which is a few kilometers away from Granada. And he, that was where the army was there, ready to, to intervene in Granada. But to make a long story short, January 2nd, 1492, is the fall of Granada. There are capitulations that were immediately violated. For example, the Sultan of Granada negotiated for the rights of property and, re, and spirituality and everything of Muslim and Jews. He put the Jews in the negotiation. That was violated very fast because in February, the, the monarchy decided to expel Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. They're expelled. Okay? Uh, and uh, January 11, 1492, Columbus goes to Granada, meets with the king and the queen, and okay, fine, we're ready. Gave the, the queen gave the, the authorization, gave the resources, and October 12, 1492, he's arriving to what we call today the Americas. I'm using these terms anachronically because really these terms, that was not the name of that place at the time, okay? It's just for the sake of communicating, okay? Because that was not the name of the, and also this place was not called Europe. This is another invention that came later, okay? This, this place had many other names, okay? But, uh, but Europe was not yet something that, anyway. So I'm, but I'm using this term just for the purposes of understanding each other, okay? So when they arrived to October 12th to the Americas, the first thing that Columbus put in his diary is, oh my God, these people are people without religion, okay? People without religion have a different connotation than today. Because you say people without religion today, oh, he's saying they're atheists. But in the late 15th century, in Christian imaginary, he had a different connotation because people with, at up to that time, human beings have religion, have gods, or, go, or a god or gods. He might be the wrong one. We might even kill each other about it. But your humanity is not in question as long as you have religion, God, or gods, or whatever, okay? That means you have a soul. But if these people have no religion, I mean, think about the fact that this, this guy, Columbus, stepped out of the boat for a few hours, okay? He stepped out of the boat, and then he came back to the boat. He already concluded these people have no religion, okay? They have no spirituality, no... So what does it mean when he says these people have no religion? It's very simple. These people have no soul, because human beings have religion because they have soul. There was this association in Christian imaginary at the time that if you have religion, you have to have religion, you're human because you have a soul. Otherwise, then you're like a cow, a monkey, or a horse. You see, you're just an animal in nature, okay? And that's, that, that notion of people without religion at the time meant people not having a soul. Okay? Now, think about this. They, they, when they arrived to the Americas, what I want, they brought all the evangelization methods they were using in Andalusia. Okay? All the evangelization methods, they brought them with them over there. Okay? But what I want to see is also what happened on the other way. Okay? From conquering the America, then what happened with the old medieval religious discrimination discourses such as Judeophobia and Islamophobia? That were medieval religious discrimination discourses going back to the Crusades. Those discourses up till that time was about 
you have the wrong religion, the wrong God. You know, we, we kill each other about this, you know, but you're a human because you have gods and religion. And, and, and my project is to convert you to mine because mine is the real one, you see? So the idea of conversion implies something, a possibility that, that's why I don't call it fully racist, these forms of discrimination, because if you converted, well, it was okay, okay? No, no problem. We will survey you to make sure you did it, you know, but it's okay as long as you convert you know, I will survey you to make sure you're not faking it, but if you convert seriously, it's no problem, okay? That means that the humanity of the person is not in question, you see? Eh, so what happened? With the conquering of the Americas and the indigenous people there, the debate about having a soul or not became a huge debate in Europe from 1492 all the way to 1552. The first 50 years of the colonization of America, there was a huge debate in the Iberian Peninsula, but because it was written in Latin, it circulated all over Europe through the, ch the church networks. And so they were reading these texts about, okay, who are these people they encountered there? So there were critical voices already from the beginning to the project of enslaving indigenous people in America. There were people saying, oh, wait a minute, what if they have a soul? Then we're committing a crime, in the, a, a, a sin in the eyes of God. You know, so maybe we're doing something wrong here. You know, but the Spanish Empire had decided, well, they are not so less enslaved. They were enslaving them already from the beginning because the project, of course, was a project of colonization. Uh, but the, the, the whole argument and the ideology of the time posed the question, okay, are we really doing correctly or not? Okay, because if they don't have a soul, uh, it's okay to enslave them. It's like, like putting a cow or a horse or a monkey to work, you see, in the labor process. So it's no problem, but if they, what if they have a soul? Then we might be committing a sin in the eyes of God. So this debate came up, and there was critical voices already inside Europe, and already in the Americas. Some of the missions sent there, they were already questioning, did they? These were doing these abuses and atrocities, and these people, I don't know, these people might be humans, you know? We might be, they might be some of the tribes that were lost you know, from the Jewish or stripes, and they, they were speculating about all of this. They didn't know what to, but they were questioning the, the official, uh, the official uh, policy. You see, and this debate went on until in in 1537, the Pope decides and say, hey, you know what? These people have soul, but they are animal soul. So they he call it animal soul. Okay, to solve the problem, it's not really a solution because it's an animal soul. What I mean is. How could you talk about animal souls? So they're not humans. But at the same time, you say they have a soul. So it was a confusion there. So what happened was that then the Spanish Empire decides to help a trial to solve the problem. And they have Las Casas Sepúlveda in 1552 debating the issue. Because at the time, the authority of knowledge was in the hands of the church. And that's why the, the empire put the debate in the, in the tribunal in the school of Salamanca led by the church. Okay, and it's Las Casas and Sepulveda debating this. Okay, so you have this debate uh, between Las Casas and Sepulveda. Now, before we go into the debate, let's remember the following. They burn the, the, the library of Cordoba. They burn the libraries of Granada. Okay, they burn all of this. Okay, there is a plaza, like here you have the plaza where Hitler's, the Hitlerites burn, you know, and you have uh, some installation art there about this. You have the same thing in Granada. You know, there's in Granada a, a plaza where they burn all these books, okay? Uh, so, they were burning books. When they went to the Americas, they burned the codices, which were the equivalent of books for indigenous people. Remember that the Maya civilization had already the most precise calendar in the world, okay? There was nothing as precise as the Maya calendar at the time, okay? Uh, just keep that in mind, or keep in mind that the, the Muslims have already brought Greek philosophy to, to the West. Because in, in Europe, it was forbidden to read the Greeks. You were be burned alive if you read Aristotle by the Inquisition. Okay? Remember that all the knowledge of astronomy, the, the school of Baghdad before Copernicus, have already, the astronomical school of Baghdad, decided. And, and do a mathematical demonstration that the Earth is not the center of the world, that the Earth goes around the sun. And you know, all these things were already quite advanced 
in terms of Islamic civilization and other civilization. At the time, Europe was very marginal in all of this, okay? And, uh, and the Inquisition was a major, and, you know, was a major obstacle to production of science. Now, because of Christendom, okay? Not Christianity, Christendom. That is Christianity as a power ideology of states, which is different from Christianity as a spirituality, okay? So you have, a, a, in the case of, the, of, the, of Islam or of the Mayas or all the civilization, when they didn't have a dualism of the Christian, Christendom, they have the notion of unity, Tahit, Pachamama, etc., in which discovering things in so-called nature, first the word nature is already Western. I mean, that's another thing that I'm using here for purpose of communication because there's no notion, what is, it's a notion of life, and, and life as a cosmos with different layers of forms of life, okay, where the humans are inside that, not outside. The idea of nature and human beings over here, nature over there, and nature being an object, an inner object without life, and the life is the human, is very anthropocentric, and it's part of the dualism of Christendom. Uh, but anyway, that's, that takes me into another uh, area. But they, the point I want to try to say is that for this other cosmology, there was no conflict in, in developing science and spirituality, like it happened in Europe at the time. Because at the time, Christendom, Anything you discover in, in, in the cosmos, in nature, quote unquote, that will contradict the dogma of the church was already a threat, okay? And because it, it was a threat to Christian law and the powers that be at the time. So that, that impeded the development of science. But local European history is not world history. And that's a big mistake committed in many Eurocentric historiography, that they project the idea of what Christian, Christian don't did in Europe, and they think that all religions are the same, and it's not true. You have other spiritualities in the world that in which science developed very well without problem, because they didn't put the, the question in dualistic ways. They saw, if you discover an atom in your finger, it's, that's part of, of God. Okay, and again, the word God here is problematic because it immediately takes, you, takes us into a translation that immediately makes us think of the Christian don God, which is, a, is, a, is a, you know, an old guy in the, somewhere in the sky with a beard, you know, looking down and watching everybody. You know, this is, but in, in these other cosmologies, there is a, this, the idea of God is very, it's, it's not exactly the way we think about God in Christianity, you know? It's more a cosmological notion of life and cosmos, okay, with different layers from the, from the, uh, from the astronomical to the local. And so anything you discover or any, anything you, is not in contradiction because it's part of that cosmos, you see, of Pachamama or Allah, the notion of Allah. Uh, it's, it's very similar to Pachamama. It's not exactly God the way we think in, in the anthropocentric way. You see, uh, it's, it's something else, okay? So I'm saying that because there were other, other cultures that did not have this conflict that happened at the moment <laughs> in Europe in which, so there were, that's why in many other places there was a lot of development science without becoming a contradiction, without having to repress them like happened in Europe at the time. So I'm just mentioning this thing because there are basic things that sometimes we lose sight of them and sometimes we uh, project local European history and world history and we think that because it was like this here, it was like that everywhere else. And we need to, to pay attention that it's not necessarily so, okay? Now, uh, uh, so you have the debate of Las Casas, so they burned the books, also the codices, in, in, of indigenous people, they burned the libraries of And Andalusia, and they, they, you have the debate of Las Casas Sepúlveda, where Sepúlveda is arguing that they have people without soul, okay, and therefore these, pe these indigenous people have no soul, and because they have no soul, then uh, there's no problem in enslaving them, etc. And then you have Las Casas saying, well, these people have a soul, but they're like childs and need to be taken to maturity, and what we need to do is to Christianize them. So these are the two major discourses that are going to run across the next 400 years about the other. That is going to be either the 
what we call today in the literature biological racism, that is the Sepulveda line, or cultural racism, which is the Las Casas line. Okay? Uh, now, what is interesting about the debate of having a soul or not is that it contaminated the old religious discriminations that were medieval, like Judeophobia, Islamophobia. Okay? It contaminated it because now the Morisco, which is the forced converted Muslim, and the Marrano, the forced converted Jews, okay, who were now surveilled, uh, now the debate about indigenous people was going on the first 50 years of the 16th century, now contaminated this other debate. Because now the question becomes, what if these people don't have a soul either? And they start using a term that is sujetos desalmados. In Spanish, that means subjects without soul. Okay? And they were using this to talk about the moriscos and the marranos. Now, this is very important because it's the moment in history when antisemitism of the Judeophobia type and of the Islamophobia type becomes racial. It stopped being a medieval discourse and become modern racial discourse. Because now, in, this, uh, in this, these courses, they're going to frame it as, a, as people that have no soul. So now the question of conversion becomes irrelevant. So now it doesn't matter if they converted, if their kids are now baptized by the church. It doesn't matter. Now there is a more fundamental question. Now, before it was people who pray to the wrong God or to inferior God or to the wrong religion or inferior religion. Now, people who pray to the inferior religion, inferior God, are themselves inferior beings because they don't have a soul. So this contaminated the old medieval discri religious discrimination, turned them now into racial discrimination because now the Moriscos and Marranos, now it doesn't matter if you convert it or not. That, now that's irrelevant because now it's a more fundamental question about your humanity. Now these people are not so, that means they're not humans. And so the point of conversion is irrelevant. So what did they do? Immediately, they began to enslave Moriscos in Andalusia. Because now, you know, forget about this thing. It doesn't matter if they are, you know, uh, uh, baptized or converted. Now they are just uh, inferior subjects, you know, uh, you know non-human, subhuman, and therefore in the eyes of God, it's like animals, you know, and let's just enslave them, okay? Now, this debate continued until finally, 1609, they expelled them from the Iberian Peninsula, the expulsion of Moriscos, okay? Because now, even though a lot of them were now born by the late 16th century as Christians and even baptized, it doesn't matter now. Because now the whole debate that came is a boomerang effect of the colonization of the Americas coming back to redefine all medieval religious discrimination narrative and turn them now into racial discrimination. Now watch carefully how race here is not, the first form of articulation of race is having a soul or not. It's not about color. Color racism comes later. But check how now the way they articulated the question of race was through a theological religious narrative about having a soul or not which later on when the authority of knowledge passed from the church to science, then uh, uh, it turns from not having a soul to not having the DNA. Okay? In 19th century, the Sepulveda discourse got secularized and now it's from not having soul to not having DNA. The, 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 and that's in the natural sciences. Okay? In the social science is the discourse of Las Casas. From barbarians, that was the term of Las Casas that need to be Christianized in the 19th century with, in anthropology, <laughs> in social <laughs> sciences, it turned into primitive that need to be civilized. So this is a secularization of the same narrative and tropes that were already there in the 16th century. But now, because the authority of knowledge is not anymore in the hands of the church, with the Enlightenment Revolution of the 18th century, now it's in the hands of science, and now the, it shifts 
into a different uh, uh, discourse, but it's a reproduction of the same narrative. Now, before it was, you don't have it, so now you don't have the DNA, okay? Before it was that you were barbarian that need to be Christianized. Now you are a, a primitive that need to be civilized, okay? So all of this is a shift in the imaginary about racial discourse. And so what I want to claim, I want to claim many things here. First claim is that racism is not something that began in the 19th century with scientific racism like many people will portray. I'm saying this began way before. It's just that the word race, the way we know it in the 19th century was not there, but the structure of being human, non-human is the same. It's already there, okay? And the effects over population was already there, okay? Uh, now, it became later race and racism with the biological discourses of the 19th century, but it was already, you know, a human, non-human, this structure, which is the fundamental, I would say, definition of racism, uh, was already in the 16th century. So what happened? In the debate of Sepulveda Las Casas, they decided that they have a soul, but that they needed to uh, th then they needed to put them out of slavery and they put the, you might think they emancipated indigenous people, that was not the case. They put them in the encomienda, another form of coerced labor. Okay, that was not exactly slavery, but was a different form of coerced labor. Then they put the, uh, they brought Africans to replace indigenous people in America. And that's when you have now color racism emerging as another marker. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, what I want to get at here is what is racism, okay? Because we get confused in the expression or particular forms that racism acquires, and we think that's the definition of racism. If you, are, if you don't, and what I'm trying to say is that you could have color race. There are many ways, or many racisms in plural, and that means that you have different markers, of the superiority inferiority along the line of the human. Racism is a structure, institutional power of superiority inferiority along the line of the human. How you mark this will be very diverse depending on local colonial histories. In some places, it was fundamentally through color. In other places, it was through religion. In other places, through ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. Look at Northern Ireland. It's a good example because color could not be the marker, because they were all the same skin color, the British and the Irish. What did they use? They used religion. And they will use Protestant, Catholic, okay? And then they made you believe this is a, a religious conflict. It's not a religious conflict. It's a colonial racial conflict. The British colonized the place and then turned it into a conflict of religion, when in fact it had nothing to do with the conflict of religion. That's the marker. The marker of a structural superiority inferiority in a project of colonization Okay, is in this case religion. But in other cases, it's color. In other cases, it's ethnicity. In other cases, they, they, there are many markers. And we have to stop thinking that the particular form that racism uh, 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 acquires in the place we were born is the universal form. We have to stop thinking this way. We have to keep an open eye to different ways in which this has evolved in different local colonial histories around the world. Uh, what I'm trying then to say is that, so you have the genocide against Muslims, Jews. Genocide against indigenous people in the Americas. Genocide against African people that were brought and kidnapped in Africa and brought, they were not slaves in the shores of Africa, okay, waiting to be enslaved. Okay, I'm saying that because the language is slave trade. As if there were some slave already there, you see, waiting to be, I'm here, I'm a slave, take me to the Americas. No, they were kidnapped, captives, taken, put in boats by force, and then enslaved in the Americas. Okay? And I'm saying this because sometimes in the language, we're using the language of the masters, and we need to think about this, you know? Why are we calling this a slave trade? This is a captive trade. This is where human beings captured and taken to the America. They were not slaves over there, you know. They were captured and taken to the Americas, okay? And so, uh, so the point is the following. How you have the genocide against now African people. Uh, there were millions that were dead in the boats and in the plantation system over there. 
Okay, so they were in the millions. A lot of people kill and dead in this process, okay? A lot of people kill and dead in the conquest of Andalusia. Okay, so you have the conquest of Andalusia, Jews and Muslims, the conquest of the American indigenous people, the burning of their knowledge, burning of their libraries, and the genocide against African people. And there is another genocide that we need to talk about, and that's the genocide against women in Europe in the 16th century at the same time accused of being witches. Why are they accused of being witches? Because they have they were in the Indo-European knowledge, indigenous knowledges from this part of the world that were transmitted orally by women okay, across generations for thousands of years here. But they were bringing a knowledge about medicine, about astronomy, about all kinds of things, and accused of being witches and burned alive. Look at how fire works here. They were burning books, okay, and burning people. Fire as destruction of knowledge. So you have not only physical killing of people, but destruction of knowledge. So you have these women were killed, not their books, but themselves, because there were no <laughs> books. They were the books themselves. You see, and they were burned alive, okay, in the name that these are witches with crazy knowledge, you know, uh, demoniac knowledge, you know, the evil knowledges, and this is how they portrayed it, when in fact these were indigenous sciences, you know, that were transmitted from, from where to where here, and, that it, and we're talking about millions, we're not talking about a few thousand here, millions of women killed and burned alive in the 16th century here, in this place we call Europe today. Okay, so look at how, look at the, the formation of modernity in relation to these four genocides, okay? Why I'm saying this? Because then by the mid-17th century comes Mr. René Descartes, okay? And says, which is the foundation of modern knowledge, no? And he will say, I think, therefore I am. Now, what is he saying there? I, mean, I think, therefore, I exist. That's what he really said. I think, therefore, I exist. So this phrase is coming after all these genocides and all these conquests, okay? And he's saying that from Amsterdam, the moment when Amsterdam had defeated the Spanish Empire and displaced Spain, and the Iberian Peninsula from the center of this European war economy that emerged after 1492. And now, from the center of this system, Amsterdam, here comes Mr. Descartes and say, I think therefore I am. Now this, I would call it a war historical event. Because when he say, I think therefore I am, what he's saying, and he said very clearly, is that he takes, it's a challenge to the authority of the church, okay, it's a challenge to the authority of the church, and he's, what he's saying now is that all the attributes of the Christian God are going to be in this eye, okay? He used the term God eye view. This eye is able to produce a God eye view of the world, that is, produce a knowledge that is universal in the sense of the point of view of all points of view. The the, part, the point of view that takes all the particularities into account. It's a God eye view. He used the term. He's able to produce God eye The universal in the sense of beyond time and space. Objective in the sense of neutrality. <laughs> okay? Because it's the point of view of all point of view. So it's neutral. Okay? It's not now partial or biased. Okay? Now why I'm going after the card? Because this is the foundation of the Western social sciences. We're still very Cartesian in the way we think about social science. We reproduce a subject-object division, we reproduce the idea of objectivity and neutrality, we reproduce, I'm talking about the hegemonic dominant trends in the social science. Because you have, of course, inside the Western University, people questioning this, okay? But as a trend, you're supposed to be unbiased, objective in the sense of neutrality. You're supposed to produce a knowledge that is 
uh, you know, valid for all particular, you're not supposed to be in, in a particular location while you produce knowledge. You're supposed to take into account all the particularities, no? And, and so, what he's, what he's doing here is producing something I'm going to call idolatric universalism. Why I'm calling it idolatric? Because he is taking the God I view, now he's replacing the Christian God with this I. That he never says who is this I. He never says it's this or that. He always says I, this I is able to produce all these, have all these attributes. And the attributes are the same attributes as the Christian God. It's just a secularization of the Christian God. So now God is dispensable. We can take him out. We don't need him anymore. Now, someone has become God-like. Who is this I here? And here is what Enrique Dussel, in his Philosophy of Liberation, says, the I think, therefore I am, is preceded by 150 years of I conquer, therefore I exist. Okay. The I think, therefore I exist, is preceded by 150 years of I conquer, therefore I exist. Therefore, this is the imperial being speaking. And, and this imperial being has gender and has sexuality. Okay? Because it's the imperial male Western heterosexual being. This is the one I speaking. Okay? So what he's trying to say, this ego political knowledge of the car that tries to hide who is speaking and where they're speaking from, that tries to produce is an epistemology of a knowledge that is supposedly to be unsituated, okay? You're not supposed to be situated anywhere. Because the only way he can claim that is using, it's two things, dualism, he needs dualism to claim that. He needs to behead the eye from the body. He needs to cut off the head. That's why he needs the dualism. The, the mind is floating somewhere and is separated from the body and nature, Okay. What happens if you put the head in the body? Then you cannot claim you're a God. I view. Because that means you're, you're in a location in the world. That means you're born in a certain moment in time and, and you cannot claim you, you can produce the, the, a, a God-like a God -like knowledge. The only way you can claim that is by claiming that this eye, is, it is, the mind of this eye is, is floating somewhere. It's a different substance from the body and nature and therefore, it's undetermined by any particularity. You see? And it's able then to produce a knowledge like God-like because it's like floating in heaven somewhere and watching everything and taking all points of view you know, into account. You see? The other thing he needs is silopsism. Uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, silopsism. 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 Solipsism. Solipsism. Uh, he needs the solips solipsistic method which is, again, cutting off the human being. It's, a, it's, a, it's an internal monologue in which certitude will arise through this internal monologue. Okay? And you need to then, the, 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 this I produce a knowledge that is not dependent on relation with other human beings, not dependent with social relation with anybody. Okay? Knowledge is not produced dialogically or in dialogues with other humans. It's Produce in an internal monologue. Why he needs that? Because if he claims a God, a God I view, okay, then you need to cut off this, this I from society. But what if the subject produce knowledge socially, socially, in social relations? Then you cannot claim you have a God I view because social relations are historically shifting in time, etc., and space. You know? And so if you bring time space, then you cannot claim that you are beyond any particularity. You see, and that you have a God I view. You see, you need to have these two things there for him to make this claim. Now, I want to say something about what he's saying, about what Dusa said, because I want to say something a little bit more dramatic than him. I would say not just that behind the I think, therefore I exist, is the I conquer, therefore I exist, that is that there is the, the, the imperial being, in this case, a, a Western male, heterosexual, etc., who are, this is the, the guy that is speaking, okay, it's not, it's not any I, because in the common sense of the time, there is an already 
power structure in place in which no being from the non-Western world have rationality, male or woman, and no woman have rationality, be that Western or non-Western. So in the common sense of the time, you didn't need to define it, because in the common sense of the time, it was already constitutive of this uh, I, this idea of who has rationality access to this godlike view. It was very clear at the time that it was only males, Western males. Okay? Now, I will add something to the I conquer, therefore I exist, and I will say that the condition of possibility for a war historical event, I call it a war historical event because it's the for, for the first time in war history, you have someone now saying that he's got like a, 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 an epistemology, a philosophy produced from the assumption of godlike knowledge. Because if you look to any other tradition in the world, nobody will claim that they are godlike or they're thinking as God or anything like that. Okay? And I'm being here very, very uh, strong on this. You could look at the Jews, you could look at the Muslims, you could look at the Maras, you could look around the world. You don't have that pretension. People will tell you, okay, I am a philosopher, I'm a theologian, whatever, but I'm thinking from Islam, or I'm thinking from this part of the world, or I'm thinking from Aymara, I'm thinking... Nobody will say, I'm thinking from nowhere. Because I'm like, I'm godlike. That's called idolatry in Islam, that's called idolatry in early Christianity, that's called idolatry in, Islam, in, in, the, in Judaism, that's in, in other traditions, that's impossible that a human being could be like the cosmos, okay? Uh, so it's impossible. So it's, 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 it, the cosmos is beyond any human being. So you cannot say you are thinking from the point of view of Pachamama or Allah or things like that. But anyway, so I'm saying it's a world historically banned because it's this pretension, no, to be godlike. Now, uh, what I want to say is that behind I conquer, therefore I exist, which is behind the I think, therefore I exist, is I exterminate. Therefore, I exist. Okay, I'm, I'm saying something stronger here. That is the condition of possibility for now being able to write this way and say, I think therefore I am, without having to define who is this I, is the previous exterminations in which you have not only genocide, but something Boaventura Sosa Santos called epistemicide. Because now you have the destruction, not just of people, but of the knowledge of those people. You have the destruction of Muslim knowledge, the destruction of Jewish knowledge, the destruction of indigenous knowledge, the destruction of African knowledge, and the destruction of women knowledge, Western or non-Western. And I will claim that this type of idolatric universalism is inherently inherently <laughs> racist and sexist epistemologically. Because rationality is only in the hands of certain human beings. The rest of humanity is outside the, the range of rationality. Okay? And that's, so I went into this history a little bit to, to put the context of how is it that suddenly someone can stand up? Probably in the 13th of century, okay, many Centuries before, it would have been difficult to say the I think therefore I am in just this way, okay? But with these genocides as, as preceding and this conquest, okay, then it becomes who is left as authority of knowledge. You see, who is left? It's Western men who is left, okay? The women are out, they have already exterminated millions of them in Europe. They are not part of the realm of rationality. They're witches, they're crazy, they're whatever, okay? African people are out, indigenous people are out, Muslims are out, and Jews are out. Who is left now? Here, in this territory, you know? in this place in the 17th century. Western men. You see? And here you have, I'm going through the history, because it's a history that is forgotten when we discuss questions of Methodology, production of knowledge in the westernized university. Okay? Because we have become so, it, it has become like such normative, you know, such a norm that we don't even think carefully about this, you know, about why are we calling social scientific theory something produced 
from males of five countries. You see what I mean? I mean, why don't we call it Western heterosexual men social science? Okay? Or Western heterosexual men knowledge. Okay? Why is it that we call it philosophy? Social science? Well, it's very simple because we are we were born already in a world whose structure okay, ontologically is already constituted, okay, the universe of meaning is already constituted by these previous exterminations and conquests that have put Western man as the privilege of knowledge. And so when you build universities or you build knowledge, etc., along these lines, then we don't take a step back to question, okay, is this, well, I mean, this is what we call science or philosophy. You go to a philosophy department, and you go and say, you know what, I want to teach indigenous philosophy, or Islamic philosophy, or Buddhist philosophy.